before I was born, my parents met, fell in love, and got married in Mexico. And they knew that before they started to have children, they knew they had to leave Mexico in order for their children to have more opportunities than what they had. You see, they wanted to come to the U.S. so that their children could have exposure to other cultures and other languages, things that they had not experienced before. More importantly, they wanted their children to have the opportunity to really live out that American dream. And so shortly after my parents got married, my dad, the bravest, most courageous man that I know to this day, said to my mom, I'll go first. He left everything behind, his family, his friends, his work. The only language he knew was Spanish, but he was willing to come for his children. And so he did, with only a few dollars in his pocket. A month later, he called my mom and said, I'm ready. I'm going to send for you. I have a job now. I know a few words in English. I'm ready. I have $10 in my pocket. Come, join me. We can start a family. My mom, the most compassionate, kindest person, loving soul that I know, without any hesitation, said, I'm coming and we're starting a family. My parents moved to the US, Dallas, Texas, and more specifically, Pleasant Grove. My childhood home still stands where it did back in the 70s. I'm within a drive away, a short drive away from that. Me, I am a first American born citizen. My first language was Spanish, that is, until my oldest sister started kindergarten. And my sister Marie would go to kindergarten and she would learn the ABCs and she would learn the numbers and any words that she could absorb. And she would come back and teach her four youngest si siblings English. She was able to teach us that. So by the time that I started kindergarten, I was prepared, I was set up for success. I was bilingual. I could speak two languages. And I'm forever grateful to my sister for that. So again, I would speak Spanish with my parents because of the sacrifices that they did. And then I learned English and I would do that at school. When I was in school, there was no program such as English as a second language in any of the schools around here. And I remember one day a classmate of mine, she, I saw her struggling. She didn't speak English as well. She knew I spoke Spanish, so I asked her, can I help you in Spanish? And she asked me a question in Spanish, and I answered her in Spanish. And I heard a faint voice behind me from a teacher saying, don't do that. I continued to help the little girl because I didn't think she was talking to me. I didn't do anything wrong. Why would she be talking to me? So I proceeded to answer the questions to my classmate in Spanish. But this time, a stern voice, Laura, stop. Don't do that. If you do it again, you're going to the principal's office. I was confused. What did I do wrong, I asked. She said, you spoke Spanish. This is America, speak English. If you do it again, you're going to the principal's office. Assimilate, adapt, be like everybody else. For me, that was very confusing for me at the time because the ages this is me between the ages of seven and nine. I was confused. I didn't know that was wrong. After all, I spoke Spanish to honor the sacrifices that my parents had made for me. And yet I was being told by a person of authority to no longer do that, that that wasn't okay. Part of my identity was being stripped away from me without me even knowing. I was a child. I didn't know how to defend myself. I didn't know and no one was there to help me. Imagine the psychological effects that has on a child. Think about that. It's like telling a child, you can't play with that toy or you snatch the toy away from them. We all know how that feels. No kid likes that. But mine was worse. I was being asked to not be myself, to take a piece away of my life that I had respected for so long and to stop. I didn't understand. Raise your, raise your hand if you know a child between the ages of one 
to 11 years old. It doesn't have to be your child. It can be a, a niece, a nephew, grandson, neighbor's kid, a school, community, church, anyone. Keep your hands up, please. It could be a friend's daughter, son, anybody. Well, I'm here today to propose that you, you, and you, and everybody who raised their hand, that you start to talk to your children about what diversity and inclusion mean. That you start to educate them on what that truly means. Diversity. It's the differences that we all have. Celebrating those differences. Recognizing. Understanding them. The inclusion piece of it is being kind. Being compassionate. Inviting someone else to the table along with you. That's all it means. It's simple. Teaching our kids, talking to our kids, the same way when you're helping them with math or science or reading, talk to them about inclusion, the art of belonging and being kind. Equip our children with powerful tools that they can use one day as they continue to grow up because guess what? They will grow up. These children of today will grow up to be police officers, policy makers, recruiters at corporate America, judges, and even the President of the United States. It's our obligation. Let's start changing the narrative. It's up to us to make it better. Research shows that kids between the ages of zero to three years old, they start to notice the differences in our skin tones. They don't know what it means yet. They're too little, they're too young. But they also start to pick up on the words that you're using, the words that you're using to describe those differences. Be careful with that. Kids ages four to six start to identify with those identities. More importantly, they start to put a positive connotation behind that identity or a negative connotation. Kids ages seven to 11 years old start to get deep in that relationship with their identity. They start to know who they are. Again, for me, I was confused during that time. It's our obligation to empower our children to be courageous, to be confident, and to own their identity. That starts with you and you and everybody in this room. I remember when I was graduating high school, I was becoming an adult, and I reflected on the sacrifices that my parents had made for me and the opportunities that were approaching. And I was so excited because those opportunities that I had were because of my parents' sacrifices. And for me, that's when I took back my identity. What that teacher had said, I blocked it out. I forever, I never looked back. And I was proud of who I was. I was proud of my parents and their sacrifices. No longer was I embarrassed to speak Spanish. A couple years after that, I ended up working at one of the largest entertainment and telecommunication companies in the entire world. And guess what? They paid me extra to speak Spanish to the customers. <laughs> they did. I was proud. And they fully embraced me. My, my previous employer fully embraced every single part of me and who I was. And I didn't have to hide. I would walk in the door proudly, never had to hide. But also, that was the first time that I encountered a bully. Just a couple years ago, about three years ago to be exact. And at first I didn't understand. I like to think that I'm nice, a nice person. People like me, I work well and I'm smart and I have good ideas. That's what I thought, but no matter what ideas I had or what ideas I shared with this person, everything was a no. He never wanted to collaborate with me. He never wanted to work with me. No matter what of my initiatives, nope. Not going to do it. Not going to support you. And I didn't understand. I didn't. But as, he, as more and more time passed by, he got comfortable with being a bully to me. And he started to use words that were demeaning in front of others, in front of 30, 40 people at a time. And I remember, I remember that I wanted somebody, just one person, one person to defend me. But that never happened. That never happened. No one spoke up for me. Nobody did. And I, I had to take that. I did. I did speak up. 
It wasn't okay. The behavior that he was demonstrating was not okay. And the more that I started to share this story with my, my friends and colleagues at work, the more I realized it wasn't just me. That this male colleague, he had been at the company for over 40 years, and he just didn't value the opinion of women. He didn't work well with women. He didn't like our ideas. And that was sad. That was sad for me. So I, again, spoke up appropriately at my company. And um, again, unfortunately, fortunately for me, that resolved itself. But that is a consequence. If we don't teach our children of how to own their identity, how to educate other people that don't look like them or think like them, that is a consequence, and that could happen. And if we're intentional about creating gender diversity and inclusion ambassadors, if we're very intentional about that, we can change. We can change a lot of good things for our children. It's going to help us reduce bullying, cyberbullying, bullying at work. It does happen. It's going to help us reduce gender biases that unfortunately are still happening to this day. And it's also going to help reduce racial profiling and hate crimes that we all know, unfortunately, are happening in this world. And right now, all we can do is turn a blind eye. And we shouldn't. We should start change. We should start changing the narrative today. We shouldn't wait. So I'm asking everyone to do three easy things, three simple steps. Role model the behavior that you want to see in your children. Be careful and mindful of the words that you choose to use in front of your children when you are describing the differences of others. Be mindful of that. Be mindful of the behavior. Be compassionate, be kind to others. That's what we want to see in our children. Number two, assess the environment in which your children are in. Start with their school if you're asking how. If you look at their school, does everyone in their school look like them, think like them, come from the same backgrounds? That's not diversity. And guess what? When your child goes to university or starts in corporate America, they're going to get hit with culture shock. So it's up to you to change that, to create experiences for your children that will help them understand different cultures. There's no excuses. You can go to a different restaurant outside of your neighborhood and try a different meal from a different country. There's no excuses. We live in this huge city of Dallas. No reason you shouldn't. And there's so many different events happening throughout the community. So we just celebrated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. International Women's Day is coming up. Veterans Day is coming up. Diwali, Hispanic Heritage Month. Pride. No reason why you should not create those experiences for your child. And number three, create a safe space for your children. Let them be able to talk to you about things that are happening in their lives, things that they're experiencing. It's so easy. The same way you're teaching them about math and science, talk to them about the art of belonging and being kind about what diversity and inclusion really means. I'm not asking you to do anything that I wouldn't do. These, the picture you see behind me, these are my children, Lily and Diego. They're, they are junior diversity and inclusion ambassadors, and they've been that way since I can remember. And the proud moment for me was when I was a hands, probably 20 feet away from my children, and I remember when my son, he was eight years old at the time, somebody said something racist, and my son said, that's not okay. That's a racist thing to say. Don't say it again. That was a proud moment. And my son is now educating his friends, and my daughter is now educating her friends about what that means as well. It's very important. I do this to pay homage to my parents and pay tribute to the sacrifices that they did when they moved over to the US to give me more opportunities to live out the American dream. That's why I teach my children. I'm educating them and I'm empowering them so that if they're confronted with a bully or a teacher that says you can't be who you are, that they know how to defend themselves. 
that they own their identity and they're proud of who they are. I'm empowering my children. So tonight, when you and you and you go home tonight and you hug your children or your neighbor's kids or your niece or nephew, when you go home and you hug them, start changing the narrative. Teach them about what diversity and inclusion means. It's important. If we do this right, if we do this consistently, we have the opportunity to change their schools, the community, and even society. Thank you.